Hey everyone, and welcome. This is Pop X Cast, where science fiction meets pop, pop culture. We are a geek podcast for geek cu- culture. So, are you ready to get your geek on? Sit back, relax, put on that Ninja Turtle onesie, warm up those chimichangas. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pop, pop X Cast. I'm Josh Liston from On The Bubble Podcast, an oral history of television fandom, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You are listening to Pop X Cast, where science fiction meets pop culture. Captain's Log Supplemental. Pop X Cast. Oh. Ah. Hasta la vista, baby. where science fiction meets pop culture. I am Austin Burke, the Appalachian geek at heart. Oh my God, it's so good to be back. We would like to welcome everyone joining us live in the popx.live chat room. Come hang out with us and join the conversation at popxcast.com. If this is your first time tuning into PopX, the first 20 minutes or so, we're going to run down the headlines since our last show, and then we're going to dive into the show topic at the halfway point. So stick around. Geeky goodness is coming your way. Joseph Burke, how you doing? doing man i am sitting here dude i am looking at your name here on the platform we're using and it's called george um <laughs> why is your name george austin is, it, I mean, is there something really, george? are you from the jungle, jungle. No, like, <laughs> what is what seriously what is going on what's with, happening with george? here no i don't know what's I, happening i'm been in a wacky mood joe and it's, it's getting worse <laughs> it's, it's not good it's man. progressively getting worse well i'm telling you i haven't had to go to vegas to get the comedic shenanigans that was going on here 30 <laughs> minutes before the show went live so that's why my face is so red because i've been laughing hysterically for the past th- i mean i'm not joking for the past 30 minutes austin you are off the rails tonight i'm loving every minute of it <laughs> Oh my God, dude, I love you so much. But uh, dude, it is so good to be back here. We took a little late summer hiatus. Uh, Alex, my wife and I, we actually attended Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios for the past four weekends. And uh, we are huge uh, theme park goers and, and, and all of that stuff, especially when it comes to Halloween Horror Nights and all the scares and all the thrills that comes with uh, the October months, if you will. So we uh, took a little break, took a little hiatus, and we are back here. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the month off. Uh, I'm, you know what? I can say I'm, I'm glad to be back here at Pop X Cast. I kind of mix, mixed it a little bit. So it's, yeah, I, I missed you guys. I missed, I missed our fans. I missed the people that tune in. I missed everybody, so... I just missed the whole thing. All yeah. all the stuff. All the, the stuff. Things. Yeah. Getting yeah. geeky. Getting geeky, yeah. So I am your host, Joseph Burke, Central Florida seasoned comic book nerd. And I got what in the world? I got a hair in my mouth. Anyway. Not fuzzy. <laughs> Here he goes again. <laughs> I'm your I can't even get through the monologue. <laughs> uh, Central Florida seasoned comic book nerd and retro enthusiast. Now be sure to head over to Google Play or iTunes after the show and click on that subscribe button and catch up. Uh, on some more amazing shows from the pop x archive and uh we have while you're there make sure that you leave us a glowing and wonderful five-star rating and review on not only on itunes but anywhere that you subscribe and you listen to pop x whether it's on spotify google play or itunes we would certainly appreciate your feedback and your comment and your support so thank you so much and uh so Lindsay. Uh, what's new in your world? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just been business as usual. Kids keeping busy. I'm keeping busy. And since school started, I've still been enjoying that wonderful full day <laughs> off to do whatever <laughs> I feel like. And it's been oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, I have missed you guys though. And I am excited to dive deep into the conversations after the news today. Cause it's been a nice time catching up on all of those episodes as well. So and you are our mm-hmm. favorite geeky Oki, by the way. Oh, thank yes. you. Yeah, yes, I yeah. am Lindsay Badger, your favorite geeky Oki. And if you have missed 
episode 101, which was our last episode a couple weeks back, make sure you go over to our official website at popxcast.com for this and all of the other great past shows from the Pop X cast collective archive collective of geeky goodness. Yes, indeed. And you know, 101 was a really cool episode. We have one it of was. my friends on, Mr. Matt Sanders from the Containment Unit. And mm. we have gotten so much wonderful, positive feedback from that episode, and especially from the Ghostbusters fan communities. So, guys, thank you so much for all of that. And just, you know, send it, seeing me in the hallway over at church or whatever, just, you know, sharing some geeky love with me. Thank you, Matt. I really do appreciate that. And so, uh, you guys ready to transition into some Pop X news? Let's oh, yeah. get into it. All right, let here we go. Don't go nowhere. I'll be right back. Extra, extra. Read all about it. This is Pop X News. Nice. Coming to you live right here on PopXCast.com. <laughs> Oh, Mike, Mike, Mike. Oh, man. We'll be delighted to tell you that Mike will be joining us for the half duration of the show. So he's got some pretty cool stuff coming up. We love to hear from Mike. All right. Top of the leading news here. Spawn has some big milestones coming up with the 300th issue and Spawn 301. Now, I was very fortunate to get the standard copy of Spawn number 300, and it is pretty awesome. It's a, it's just like $7.99 for this one comic, but it's like Whoa. 90 pages thick. It's there you a go. huge That's book. The value. So, but questions about the future of the franchise and the possibility of a Spawn verse have started bubbling up. For those who have been paying attention over the last you know, few years from the 90s, nostalgia has never been more prevalent than today. And Spawn is one of the those properties that could literally ride the wave. Now, during an interview with Todd McFarlane, he was asked about the idea of a Spawn universe. Before the question even got completed, the creator was absolutely 100% on board with the idea and believes it's going to be it's going to definitely happen. Now, the wheels are already turning on this one, and it will be interesting to see what shape it takes place and the project becomes clear in the coming days. I will say this too. Now, there's been some really great traction in the Spawn film as well as they're getting ready. It, with, there was reading an article about the Joker and how the Joker is paving the way for the success of Todd McFarlane's Spawn. Mm-hmm. And so if, if you've seen the Joker right uh, this weekend, you will understand exactly what that statement means. Nice. That the, the, the <clears throat> adult R-rated genre comic book, um, if you will, is definitely those stories and those storylines are definitely be making a really big transition. Right. And it kind of all started with Deadpool, right? So yeah, the yeah, darker, oh, yeah. more yeah. adults yeah, focused absolutely. characters. Yeah. Now, um, didn't this week Todd McFarlane hit a milestone? He did hit a milestone. He actually yeah. with uh, issue number three hundred and one. I'm glad you asked that, Lindsay, um, because with issue number three hundred and one, he was entered into the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest running indie comic art creator and franchise. Now he That's started. That's pretty incredible. If you guys remember, Eric Larson, Rob Liefeld, Todd McFarlane, and Jim Lee all disbanded Marvel in the late 90s to start Mm -hmm. IDW, all right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, from that, that's when Tom McFarlane created Spawn number one. And from there, it has continued on and just this past week passed 301, entering it officially into the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest-running self-made indie comic book. Wow. That's impressive. Pretty freaking impressive. Good job, Todd. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, the, pretty Todd father. the Todd Father. The Todd Father. The Todd Father. Well, Joe, I, I take to what you say about the Joker movie kind of paving the way for that because Spawn is a very dark character that I think deserves an R rating, you know? And, yes. and now that we have Deadpool and we have a Joker, that, that really does pave the way for a movie that I am, with this news and all of the things happening with the movie and now the Joker, I am pumped for this movie, man. You're I'm not so the only one, dude. And, yeah. and Jamie Foxx is playing Spawn. Oh, yeah. oh my God. Oh my god! Oh yeah, dude, dude, I'm I'm done. That's gonna be good. Yeah, where's my credit card at now? Yes, <laughs> awesome. Man. Hey, before we go into the next segment, we're for Austin reads. I want to give a huge shout out to Sean Hockney over in the chat room. We got Luke McCracken hanging out with us, and all of the amazing Jeff Adams is here as well, and just awesome. all the amazing uh, Pop X listeners and watchers. Right. If you guys are here, uh, exactly. definitely leave us a comment here on the side. Share this out on your local feeds. Like if you're watching this live. And share it out to one of your favorite groups or one of your favorite pages that you like. Hey, check out my Team Pop X. All right? Cool, man. All right, Austin. Take it away, dude. 
Let's go from Spawn to Wolverine. So Wolverine made his long return to the Marvel Universe over the course of the past few years. Now he's finally returning to his ongoing series from Marvel Comics during the Marvel Comics X-Men Dawn of X panel at New York Comic Con. Marvel Comics announced Wolverine number one, kicking off Logan's first solo ongoing series since 2014. The new Wolverine series will launch in February as part of the second wave of the Dawn of X titles. The series sees Logan on a mission to stop humans who would take advantage of the gifts offered by the mutant nation of Krakoa. 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 Now, Krakoa is actually, and that's really cool that you brought that up, Austin. Krakoa, if, so there was this shift in the X-Men franchise that's happened in the past six months in Marvel Comics, generally. I'm talking about the publications. There is two series that's out right now, The Powers of X and The House of X. So one week, The House of X is released. The next week, The Powers of X is released. Now, it's just getting ready to come to its finality this week at the local comic book shops as Powers of X uh, is th- six of six is being released this week, which concludes. Now, long story short, the X Men universe as we know it has been reconceptualized, and Krakoa is their home. Think of it as a space inside of a space, like a world and a dimension only the mutants with the X gene can go to. Okay? okay. So, out of that, definitely Logan. So, the leaders of this area, Apocalypse. Magneto, Doctor Doom, Charles Xavier, Nightcrawler, Beast, and Wolverine. Dang! So that's a, that's a it's it's awesome. Goodness, right if, there. It's, yeah. I think in two months it's coming out on trade paperback, where you don't have to buy all the issues together. You can just buy the little book and and read them. Definitely pick oh, up man. House of X and Powers of X, two separate books, but they are all in the same storyline. Oh, that's yeah. awesome! Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. pretty cool stuff. Sweet. Lindsay Badger. Well, let's shift into some video game news. Uh, Yesterday, developer Saber Interactive and publisher Mad Dog Games Ghostbusters the video game remastered released onto PS4, Xbox One, PC, and the Switch by Nintendo. Since players have gotten their hands on the game, they have found a new addition that wasn't in the original game. A touching tribute to the late Harold Ramis. Oh, wow. Right after the opening scene in the game, the following message pops up onto this, onto the screen in loving memory of Harold Ramis. Ramis co-wrote the iconic 1984 movie and also starred in it as Egon Spengler. In ni- in the 2014, Ramis died at the age of 69, mm-hmm. and the non-remastered version of Ghostbusters the video game hit out in 2009, which was before his death. So that was kind of cool that they added that little special tribute into the re-release of this video game. Yeah. Are either of you guys going to be playing this? I title? actually, all right, nerd alert. I own the original PlayStation 3 2009 copy of this game. I am not surprised at all by that I answer. own it. <laughs> I do own it. And um, it is definitely very much playable on my PlayStation 3 console. And everything works cool. perfectly. But given said that, uh, with the remastering on the PlayStation 4 and the modern day consoles, it's even on Switch, guys. For like less than 30 bucks, I think you can buy the remastered game. It's mm-hmm. kid-friendly. You, I mean, you literally walk around Manhattan with your Proton Pack. <laughs> I mean, cool. it is it is insane. Can I we mean, bask in the glory of the graphics over here? I know this is just yeah. a screenshot, but I mean... Well, here's the cool thing. Not only are the graphics uh, 3D modeled after the original actors themselves, the voices are also even Bill Murray. Perfect. Is, no way. I am not lying Didn't to you. Know that. It's, wow. if, if you own a Switch or you own... It may even be on on the mobile uh, platforms as well. I'm not sure, cool. but they did this as their big 35th anniversary uh, for for Ghostbusters. I believe it's the 35th, if I'm not mistaken. 35th or 40th, I can't. I think it's 35th. But uh, yeah, long live Harold Ramis. We love you, dude. Yeah. Your legacy lives on even to today. Yes. All right, so coming up from uh, Ghostbusters to the world of Joker, we were just talking about that just a few minutes ago. And uh, man, uh, Austin and I were talking before the show, we're even considering doing episode 103 this week and just doing a solid hour of just Joker ranting. Yeah. So uh, we'll keep you guys updated on that. But uh, 
looking pretty probable at this point. Joker opened in theaters and started setting all-time new records on Friday. The film broke Venom's October opening day record by earning more than $39.8 million, million alone on Friday. Now, it then had the biggest October opening weekend ever, and it was earning $93.5 million to far surpass Venom's $80 million in 2018. Now, Joker is now uh, Warner Brothers' biggest opening weekend since Justice League opened in November 2017. Now, Joker nearly matched Justice League's first weekend total, coming within a half a million of Justice League's $93.8 million wow. opening weekend. Now, that's an R-rated standalone movie could come you know, close to surpassing the big first screen outing of DC's premier superhero team is sure to surprise some fans uh, and some executives alike. And I'm not shocked. Now, Austin, I was reading, I was watching your channel today over on uh, the Birkinator, uh, the Flick Fan Nation, and you guys were sharing some information. What was the name, the, the totals coming out for this weekend? Uh, do we have that number yet? Yeah, so worldwide, where I believe it was about 230 worldwide opening, and wow. then of course you have the the 93 domestically, and and honestly, you know, you compare that to a movie like Justice League. Yeah, Justice League is a built up universe for four years with five, six massive characters, and it managed to barely topple Joker. Now that's definitely a testament to the Joker. It's not a testament to the Justice League. No. The man, an R-rated super villain film that has so much controversy going in. I mean, you even, and I don't want to bring this up, but you have, you know, people going out and threatening theaters and it's still opening at 93 million. Yeah. Dude, this is, this is massive, especially when we're looking at future standalone superhero villain movies down the line that are R-rated. This is it. This you, is you were talking about the threatening of the theaters. We, I, I noticed when I went and saw it on Thursday night here at my local hometown theater, there was two cops at the uh, yeah. area where the tickets, uh, where you, where they pulled yeah, the tickets. Yeah, there was a lot of scary. And um, you know, it's just really strange when you see that and you're you're kind of registering that. But at the same time, uh, a film like this, I just love. I, I I can literally talk an hour, and I know Austin, you could probably talk even much longer than that. Yes. But if you've not, there's a reason why, you know, this film it was designed the way it was. And I love the architectural look into the psyche of a guy who literally, you see him just wither away. <laughs> and it's just amazing to watch cinematically. I don't know yeah. if it's going to be one of those movies where there'll be a sequel. I don't know if Joaquin Phoenix has agreed to that. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, such, a, it's such a deep character to yeah. play psychologically, even for the actor behind the makeup. I don't even know if he could get back in the role one more time. Well, that's one of the reasons why, you know, for a while there, he was he was Doctor Strange. I mean, he had had talks with Marvel and everything, and then Marvel yeah. says, well, wait a second, we're going to need you for more than one movie, and he goes, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I think he's a one-movie kind of guy, but like you said, man, just getting to that place mentally, it's hard to do for more than one film. So even agree. if he wanted to do more, yeah. I don't know if he could do it. Couldn't agree more, man. It's it's yeah. it's hard. I mean, well, it's, it's a tough decision for an actor to commit to almost dedicating your entire career being labeled as one character, where most yeah. actors like to play multiple roles. Well, look what they did to Heath Ledger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it literally drove him to the point of no return. Yes. Madness. I mean, I mean, this is not a role meant for everyone. Yeah. yeah. You know. Absolutely. So. Anyway. Good stuff. Awesome, Burke. What you got for us? I'm going to pull you out of this deep place, and we're going to go somewhere that's a, that's a really happy place. But okay, I, I love this news nugget, man. Yeah. Uh, this, is, um, this is a show that I love, and I hold, I hold close to my heart. So here's a story <laughs> of a lovely lady, a man named Brady, and a TV sitcom that is still an American TV classic 50 years later. The Brady Bunch, which premiered on ABC on September 26, 1969. The show ran for five seasons from 1969 to 1974, part of the 50-year celebration HGTV purchased the home for $3.6 million that served at, at, that ser it's the Brady's house. Yes. Wow. On the show. The one and only, yeah. <laughs> it looks just like the interior on television. So the cast reunited this past summer for HGTV's A Very Brady Renovation. I love that. Uh, Look at that, that dude. Uh, all six of the original siblings from the show in which they helped transform the real-life North Hollywood home. What a news nugget. That, that's awesome. 
I love this. I they was even, really hoping you would bust out into songs starting this, but it's okay. Look, they even have Mike's <laughs> office there. Remember his uh, architectural office at the bottom of the stairs? Yeah, it was right there yeah. in the at the end of the stairs. And that color sure. pattern, dude. That color pattern. <laughs> that, that is so the blue and with the yellow. Isn't that like the record player or something there at the end of the stairs? Where it has little <laughs> trinkets sitting yeah. on top of it. And they even found the horse. The, the, oh, they do the have concrete the horse. horse. Yeah, that horse was in so many shots in the original series. It's crazy. That's wonderful. But uh, so that's all of the news we have. But we have a hit it of the week coming up for show you right now. Time. Yes, it's show and, and time. Now it's time for Pop X's hit it of the week. Time. All right, so hit it of the week. We got Mr. Right. Mike Ippolito from Regions and Parts Unknown. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> What's up, uh, dude? Just real quick to jump back to Ghostbusters for the 35th anniversary. Yeah, they are releasing uh, actually is a two night event. Uh, tonight and Wednesday is uh, Ghostbusters back in theaters with special adi- special added features at the end of the film. Cool. Oh, so whoa. That was real quick. is that a Fandango thing? Uh, that's a Fathom Events. Fathom. Oh, Fathom. Yeah. I yeah. love Fathom. So, I love Fathom. Yeah, but, that's awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, going back to the original reason why I was here. Yes, yes, uh, indeed. Back in July when the uh, season three of Stranger Things had dropped, uh, they also uh, tend to release their soundtracks on vinyl. The last one that I showed was the music from various artists um, mm-hmm. from the show. And now that. I finally received the um, original soundtrack, uh, Carl Dixon and Michael Stein, uh, on vinyl. And uh, oh, cool. oh, boy. Now, not mind you, he has all three seasons on vinyl. Yes, yes. they're all on vinyl. Oh, the, the mind flare, dude. Yes. That's awesome. Look at that. And the discs come in a special packaging as well. <gasps> oh, my yeah. gosh. That's yes. Kyle Lambert. That's his artwork right there. Yep. And here's the second <laughs> disc. Oh, man. That is so rad. There's Hopper. On there. And oh, the special man. edition fireworks <gasps> vinyl. No. Oh, is it see-through? Yes. It's clear. It's clear. Oh, that's cool. I love the fireworks. Oh. That is a and the fireworks. <gasps> Wow. That is freaking beautiful, dude. So that completes my collection until season four. Oh my gosh! And so, they did dude. they did announce season four. It's yes. coming, but we're not going to yes. be in Hawkins anymore. No. Yes, but they will be here filming in the Atlanta area. They're getting ready. They're setting up already. Are they really? taking us to Mother Russia? Is Mother yeah, Russia going to be in Atlanta too? It very been. well could be. Well, my presumption is. <laughs> Hopper's in the Upside Down, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's what they mean by we're not in Hawkins anymore. I think They're gonna he's have hiding to out in his Upside Down shack. Yeah, he's yeah. going to have to go find him. And uh, dude, oh, I'm and, so excited. And Mike, I do have to say that Luke was very excited to see you in the chat. Uh, yes, your show and yeah, tell. He, you oh, have fans you. on the internet. Yeah, you I'm have. Just going to let you know right Luke, now. Yeah, Luke McCracken is really excited to see. Well, you. I want to say you a huge much. shout out to and, Mr. Uh, Gabe. I do not have my or chat open, so I apologize okay. if I missed. Well, oh, okay. we'll, we'll inform people. you, big guy. We got you covered, man. Oh, yeah. It's all good. And also, I want to say hello to Gabe Salcedo and Mr. Samuel Prater, who happens to be the number one Flick Fan Nation fan of all time, as he Austin said. Has a stalker. Uh, so he is. He is definitely. <laughs> Hi Sam. Hi Sam. What are you doing here, man? What's Hi, up, dude? Hi Sam. Hi. Is it is it's awkward when somebody from your real life comes in and says, No, like, yeah, it's, I'm like, okay, so so now I feel like I have to impress him. Sam, I'm gonna impress you tonight, man. Yeah. Okay. Impress him. Like, impress him. You got ten seconds, go for it. That's how I feel when my mom shows up on live. I can do what I was like, oh. to do on, on, Did I start doing that? Are we live? I feel hands like it's almost time for a spoiler. Hands alert. away from the chest, sir. Hands away from the chest. Sorry. Okay. And check everyone. And oh, check. oh my god. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I can't with you right now. You're off the rails. All right, guys. So that is the news for this week. We're going to transition over to the topic of this week. And we want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with us this 25 minutes as we catch you up on all things Pop X Cast and news headlines. So we're going to do a little transition now and we're going to play a spoiler alert warning. Now, since it's going to be about the 1982 film, um, we're going to go ahead and roll that because maybe you've not seen it and maybe you don't want to get yeah. spoiled by some of the things we're going to be talking about, especially with the Netflix series Age of Resistance. So we're going to go ahead and roll that. We'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. Danger, danger. You are about to enter a pop spoiler alert. Beyond this point, there is no return. You have been warned. All right, so you have been warned, and uh, the premise of this is basically um, we're going to kind of, before we talk about Age of Resistance, 
which is spectacular. Spectacular. Mm -hmm. yes. um, we're going to give you some backstory into the origins of how, uh, why and how Henson created this amazing masterpiece. And a lot of people's like, well, he must have been like smoking some crazy LSD when he made That's this. That's what I thought. And I know, but <laughs> he, he was a visionary. And he wanted to take what he was doing with Muppets and Puppets on Sesame Street and create something that nobody had ever seen. And his yeah. whole goal and agenda, and I'm going to also, I'm going to give you the microphone in just a second. His whole goal and agenda was to create a film where you, where you totally forgot they were puppets and you were emotionally invested in the story and the visual yeah. aspect of the film. That was his goal. If he can make you not think it was a puppet, he achieved his goal. And I think he nailed it. I'm telling you, this is phenomenal. And, you know, I'm so excited to be able to share this with you this week that we're actually talking. Oh, my God. We're, this is Pop X cast, and we're talking about freaking Dark Crystal. This is cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. This is pretty rad. So if you're a Dark Crystal fan, holy cow, definitely uh, I want to say hello to Jaron Williams. Uh, he's What's hanging that? out with us as well. You know Jaron Talks uh, Movies. He's over on YouTube as well. Another great YouTuber right. hanging out with us tonight. Yeah. So Austin, set the groundwork for us. Kind of, kind of give us a little bit of backstory on what what is the Dark Crystal and why did Henson do what he did. <sighs> well, I'll just <clears throat> run through it. So when Jim Henson began work on the Dark Crystal in 1977, he had no story, uh, just a sense of the kind of fantasy world he wanted to create. So Henson was beginning to visualize the creatures that would inhabit this world of good and evil when he discovered the land of fraud. So mm. this was a collection a collection of drawings by Brian. Am I saying that right? Fraud or is it Brian Froud? Fraud. Brian Fraud. Brandon Fraud. Okay. Brandon Fraud. Okay. So Henson immediately contacted Fraud, who agreed to act Look as these the drawings, project's uh, conceptual designer. Okay. So once Henson, once those two collaborated and they had developed their ideas into a storyline, David O'Dell was commissioned to write the screenplay. In July 1979, Henson moved the project's pre-production uh, planning from New York to London, where he could simultaneously supervise production of the fourth season of The Muppet Show. So this guy was not only doing this. Yes. He was doing this and one of the most popular television shows of all time. So it was here that the creative supervisor, Sherry Amott, assembled the 60-member 60 60 member animatronic fabrication group who sculpted molded sewed and cared for the project's elaborate puppet cast guys this is and what i what i love about this movie is that this is one of the most detail oriented hard-working groups of people that you will ever see work on a movie and at the end of the day visually you can just tell that all of their hard work paid off and i find this entire backstory just phenomenal juggling two different things yeah. working on this getting this cast of this people, was his man. side this hustle awesome. man awesome man and you know Fantastic. so so we're looking here before Lindsay transitions over we're looking yeah. here at this amazing look at the sketch work here now brian froud was an actual he was a fantasy artist and this is this kind of genre was very popular in the mid to late 70s and mm -hmm. you know fairies and this is you're thinking of the the fairies, tolkien era sure. you know you're coming out the of whole. tolkien you're coming out of 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 the fantasy and uh, there were so many i will say this much Brian Froud not only did inspire Dark Crystal, he inspired other films. A anybody seen a little movie with Tom Cruise called Legend and Tim Curry? Oh, yes. My God. All right, so man. Brian Practical Froud's facts. work was actually used there, too. With like, If you're looking at the dwarves and the elves and all that, the pixies here, you can actually see there's a, there's, there's a legend stamp even in, this, in these early sketches right out of this sketchbook. It's wow. His, 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 there were some works that he's, he's actually done. There was a, a picture, if you can find it on Google, I don't know if we may have it, but it was like trolls, and he did this whole page of trolls, and they're all kind of woven together by their hair and by their wow. face. And cool. you're thinking, and this is a time before digital media, before digital canvas. This dude, Brian Froud, is legit. Google mm -hmm. him. Definitely pick up some of his art. Nice. Now, Lindsay, you're in, yes. you're in task of, of setting up the, the 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 inhabitants of Thra. Okay. Tell well, us tell us who they is, are. This is quite a mighty task, I will say. Um, just to kind of preface my experience, just a tiny bit before we move forward, I, for whatever reason, my childhood skipped out on this whole thing, and I don't really understand why. But um, so I was going into this, starting all of it from scratch, 
And so it took a lot for me to grasp all of the different elements that were getting woven together. So let's break down some of these and explain what we're talking about because there's a little bit of a vocab yeah. that you oh, have yeah. to pick up to, yeah. to uh, follow the storyline. So let's set up the world of Dark Crystal um, and discuss the key players from the film and the Netflix series. Both both of um, it carries through beautifully. Mm -hmm. All right, so first you start off with the Gelfling. It's a noble people who dwell in the land of Thra and are divided into seven tribes who bring order to the many regions of the land. So there's mm -hmm. like a different group that lives underground. There's a desert group. There's a, you know, stone group. There's just different, right. different landscapes have a different tribe. Got Think it. like Native American sorts. Yep. All right. And then we go into the villains of the whole storyline, which are the Skeksis. They are the keepers of the crystal. Skeksis. The Skeksis. The Skeksis. The you Skeksis. can do it. Yes. So, um, <laughs> yes, you might hear Joe and I do that every okay. once in a okay. while. They make this crazy sound. <laughs> they are evil and sneaky beings and will stop at absolutely nothing to achieve power, wealth, fame, fortune, and they want to live for eternity. Mm -hmm. And they develop a weapon to kill the Gelfling and use their essence to grow stronger and more youthful and to reverse the aging process to maintain their immortal status yeah. that yeah. they are the entire goal is to they're constantly battling death yep. is essentially what their they're cheating their, death. their whole point they're is cheating it yeah yes yes yeah. and um man they are just nasty creatures in they general are. they they really freaked me out they they will make your children have nightmares i promise <laughs> um, <laughs> Their count, their equal counterpart, because this is always like yin and yang. There is a good and an evil. Their e their equal counterpart are called the Mystics, and they are linked to the Skeksis by creation. For each Mystic, there is an equal counterpart to one Skeksi. They are linked together. Their souls are shared. There's one good for one evil. Soul is shared, and they are shared through Thra. The Mystics bring peace and harmony and balance to Thra, and they also help, they're like the guardian angels, they look over all of the little Gelflings. Yeah. So, there you go. I mean, that's that's pretty much the three heavy players that are involved. So you've got the Gelfling, the Skeksis, and the Mystics. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's kind of complicated when you're talking about the two as one. Think of this, there's one being, okay? And these this one being, this group of one beings, uh, were actually they were uh, thrown out of their homeland, and they were yeah. called the Urskex. All right, so the, these one beings figured out a way, because they're already loners. They're, 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 they're away from their homeland. They were ban a banished to Thra, and in their own w wisdom and power, figured out a way because part of them wanted to do one thing and another part of them wanted to do another. So they divided themselves. So one being became two. And so that's why Lindsay, when Lindsay was saying that they're linked by their soul, mm -hmm. the mystics and the skeksics are actually one person, but two entities right. in the land of Thra. So if now, one mystic dies, the equal counterpart of the skeksi also die at the same it. time. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the, now, the Urskex are foreigners, and they're not native to Thra. That, the, the, what you're looking at here, this is the, one of the Urskex. And mm -hmm. they are the Overwatch beings, kind of like gods, if you will. Now, they are a band of rebellious Urskex. And I was telling you about that earlier, the ones that kind of got uh, a little rowdy. And uh, they were banished from their homeworld to live on Thra. Now, after a thousand Thrine or a thousand years, Those are so years. To, yeah. Yeah. to reform themselves, they found a way to divide themselves using the crystal's very own powers. And so they used the crystals, they split themselves in two, and in doing so created two beings per one Urskek, the Skeksis and the Mystics. Now, here's a really cool, interesting uh, being that I'm going to give you, and that is Agra, Mother Agra. Yes. Now, Mother Agra oh, was actually birthed. She was birthed from Thra itself. She was not born. She's not a foreigner. She's not an alien. She's a manifestation. Think of her like Mother Earth. Yeah. And so she was literally birthed from the very essence of Thra. She's all wise, all knowing, and she's always looking out for the best interest of Thra and the Gelfling. Dude, because, I loved her. Oh, I Agra loved is her. awesome, dude. She's when, awesome. We're going to talk about, this, especially her key moment in episode six and seven 
of, mm -hmm. of Age of Resistance. Huge moments. All right, so we got Agra, and let's go in town. Now, there are also other creatures within Thra, but these are uh, basically the ones above that we've listed are the key players. These are all the key players. There's Land Striders. There's Urskex. There's, there's... Don't forget uh, the Podlings. They're the so Podlings, cute. yes. We got the Podlings there in the middle, and they're little rowdy bunches with a spoon. You know, he's going, to, I'm going to save you. But, um, <laughs> so... That's that's the premise basically. That's the world. That's the that's what Jim Henson created. Now um, I'm going to look over in the chat room because I want to make sure that I don't want to miss any comments here. But <laughs> Gelfling smoothies. I love that. Luke, yeah, Luke, that is so not right, but so funny at the same time. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the 1982 film, and okay. so. I, I'm, on, I'm on the boat with Lindsay here. I didn't really watch Dark Crystal until probably the early 2000s. And I'll be honest and I'll be transparent. It didn't really register on my radar. I was like, mm. oh, okay. You know, it was, I guess this was at a season in my life where I really wasn't appreciative of, of just the majesty and the awe that, that Jim Henson had created in these films. Yeah. And... So I did watch it, and I, I remember watching it, and, and it was at the time it was on VHS, and mm -hmm. so it wasn't the best quality in the world, and but it wasn't until probably four or five years ago, I found it in the five dollar bin at Walmart, and I picked it up, and it was on Blu-ray, and I went and watched it again for the first time. I mean, five bucks, come on, it's yeah. a great film, and so I was just sitting there, and I, not only was I looking at the story and just all the creatures and knowing that there's somebody underneath that that set yeah. that is actually controlling and maneuvering the eyes and the puppets and the hands and and uh, even the skexis you know there's one human being inside of that mm -hmm. doing all of the animatronics at one time right it's amazing and seeing that I'm, i was like i was really my appreciation not only did jim henson create the muppets and, and was a huge player for the sesame street and other films and franchises labyrinth but this, I was just like sitting there and awestruck, you know, as, as a 35-year-old man watching this literally with a fresh set of lenses on my eyes and appreciating films now like I do, being a part of Pop X cast and, and Austin, all he does, it just really hit me, man. I'm like, dude, this is really a, a story. It was right up there with Never Ending Story. Oh, it's yeah. right up there with, you know, it, for me, the Goonies. There's, there's, there's adventure. There's, there's, there's heartache. There's triumph. And uh, so, Austin, I want to go to you. What yeah. did you think about the original 82 film? Uh, you know, I, I kind of like you. I watched it when I was younger, and I just, I, I actually didn't like it when I was younger. I mean, this, was, this was five, six years ago. And I went back and I watched it recently. And, and while I can't say that I love the movie, Mm -hmm. I do love a lot of things about the movie. Anything <clears throat> technically about this film I think is brilliant. I think what the crew did and really the, the puppeteer, it's the best I, I think I've ever seen um, in a movie. I mean, you know, you have the new series, obviously, and we'll get into that. But I, my big issue here is just kind of the pacing. It, it moves mm. at such a slow pace that my wife was watching it with me. She completely checked out. She's just like, I don't think I can sit through this anymore. Mm. And I'm like, you know what? I, I get it, and, and but I'm, this is me telling her, but I'm like, you have to understand how much work went into this movie and yeah. everything in the background. And then thinking about that as you're watching the film and you look at how much lore, I mean, obviously we have a, a, a Netflix series that is based around the lore and they expanded that to a level that I don't mm -hmm. think anyone ever imagined them doing. So yeah. you have to think about all of the things that go into it. So yeah. watching it recently... I have a, a new appreciation for the movie, and it really did resonate with me so much more than it did when I was younger. And it got me um, through the roof excited about this new Netflix series. So, yeah, I, I definitely like the movie, and, and I liked what it did for the time. Yeah, uh, Mike or Lindsay, do you guys want to chime in on the 82 film? Sure. Um, I know uh, going into this that I wanted to see the movie before the series, mm. even though... The series storyline is a prequel to the original film. Mm -hmm. yep. I wanted to get that original first reaction that all of the cult 
was built on right. before immersing into the new stuff that I just felt like that was the right way to go. And I'm so glad that I did because I feel like the motion picture broke down, the, even though it was slow. I agree with Austin. I was like, I was struggling to hang on, but I'm really glad that I stuck with it because it explains the, the Skeskis and the, the mystics, separation yes. a lot better than the yeah. actual prequel did now the prequel um series explains the gelflings a little bit better but overall the the whole concept and premise of the purpose of the whole story was very well explained in the um, movie yeah so i feel like if you are going into the series without watching the original you're going to be missing in in the um series i feel drug quite a bit actually i fell asleep the first episode but um <laughs> i came back and rewatched it, it was <laughs> but um the for the technological feats that they overcame by just the pure artistic 3d modeling and yeah. the acting and yes you do tend to forget that you're watching puppets and you're getting emotionally involved with the personalities and the characters yeah. more than you're watching. How does that puppet function? Yeah. Which was, I, I feel that Jim Henson achieved his goal magnificently. Mm. Yeah. I agree. And I, I really, the more I got into the world, the more I'm appreciating it. It just, yeah. you have to be able to give it a chance. Yeah. And you know, I think the overall scope, you know, Austin, you had hit on something too there was two different forms of sets that were made. There were sets that were made for the people, the, the humans that are in the Skeksis outfits. Yes. Yeah. So that was an actual real world, real like dimensional. Body. Yeah. Then there was actually worlds that were made from a forced perspective view mm -hmm. of for the Gelfling. Because Could you imagine sticking your arm up in the air like this all, like for hours? Frank Oz did. I mean, hours. I mean, Frank Oz was one of the, um, and Jim Henson played one of the, um, uh, what was it, one of the guards. Mm -hmm. And so it, I, I just, it's just pure passion. Yeah. At the point to where, you know, you, you set aside yourself and you achieve, you achieve something. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a perfect film. I'm not going to lie to you. But at the same time, it's just the, the feat that they accomplished this on the scale that they did. Mm -hmm. It's truly astounding. Um, I don't know if Mike has anything he wants to chime in on, but um, we're going to go ahead. Mike, you want to share anything about the original 82? I think you're muted there, brother. There we go. <clears throat> there you go. Yeah, I, I'm mm. like one. I, I didn't see it when it first came out. I probably saw it a couple of years afterwards. And, I, you know, it, it's been so long, I never really remembered it. And then, to you know, with the new show coming out, it was something that needed to rewatch again. And, I mean... Pretty much like everybody said, it was it was running at a mystic space, you know, to start. You know, the film was a mystic the space. Film, I like that. You know, so but, that's perfect. Uh, yeah. You know, but you're also dealing with you know, in 1982, they didn't have the you know the technology back then, and it was it was a, a an amazing feat to did to do what they've done, you know, with, with the puppets and to make it you know realistic of you know real characters and that you weren't looking at puppets and yeah. that's the kind of feel I got for it when I watched it the second time around. You know, but uh, you, you know. really do appreciate it. Jim yeah. Henson was, was a pioneer back yeah. in the back in that time, yeah. and yeah. Brilliant person. something like that is is you know is a feat in itself. You know, thirty five, thirty six years ago. Yeah, unreal. And so, uh, w while we're all four on the, on the, on the screen here, let's let's go ahead and give our official review of uh, the Dark Crystal film, nineteen eighty two. Um, I'll start out, and I will go with an eight point two. Uh, I went next, so I'm going to go 7.5, nice. which is um, really solid. Yeah. 7.2. 7.2. Yeah. Okay. Mike? Uh, I'm going to go with an 8 on it. Nice. Yeah. So as you can see, probably the, the, the mean there is around 8. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 7.88. Yeah. So, you know, as you can see from Pop X, Team Pop X, if you've never seen Dark Crystal, there's obviously there's no profanity. It's definitely kid-friendly. Though if Absolutely. you what, let a four- or five-year-old watch it, they may be scared. <laughs> yeah, the skeskis are a little creepy, the, the, but the rest yeah. of the characters are cool. Effectively <laughs> creepy, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Effectively, effectively yeah. creepy. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, Austin, I'm going to give you the honor of helping us transition from the 82 film to 2019. Yeah, so we're going to transition, like Joe said, uh, to present day. And now we have Netflix and, and Jim Henson, or the Jim Henson Company. Uh, they've teamed up to produce a 
10 part series that is a prequel to the original 1982 mm. film. Uh, so when three Gelfling discover the horrifying secret behind the Skeksis's power, they set out on an epic journey to ignite the fires of rebellion and try to save their world. Did they nail it on capturing Henson's original vision? And does it feel like his thumbprint is on it? And Joe, I want to pose this question to you first, because, you know, as someone who, along with myself and Lindsay, absolutely, but who appreciates the original movie for Henson's kind of style yeah. and what he transferred over to his company, and now they're in control of the series, did this show live up to that expectation for you? Oh, man. You had to you had to pick me on this one, but I'm I'm kind of <laughs> glad you did. Honestly, I, I I feel if Henson was alive today, and and you know his legacy. Oh my God, I, I just yeah. love the man for for everything he created. But if he was alive today, I think that if he saw what his daughter did with his project, I think that um, he there would be so much joy coming from him because. She and the Netflix company and the Henson company, uh, and I don't know if you, if you guys knew this uh, flash, flash alert, but Jim Henson's daughter was the one that spearheaded a lot of this and the conversations between Jim Henson awesome. company and Netflix. So it was Henson's very own daughter that made, was a huge part in this. Wow. And um, I think that, yes, I think not only does it hit on all cylinders, it goes above and beyond. And in a way that story-wise, uh, kind of expanding on the world of Thra, I just it's a beautiful masterpiece. These 10 episodes are just a masterpiece. And yes, there's some parts that are slow. There are some yeah. parts that lag. And, you know, there's an episode or two that's kind of a slow burn as we get to it. But I think it's all part of the storytelling. I mean, for me, there were so many moments there. I just totally forgot that there was some dude controlling this puppet. Mm -hmm. that yeah. the story and the visual aspect was... And mind you, there's only like 10% CGI in this entire series. Yeah. yeah. it's. It, I mean, the only time they use CGI is maybe on the flight scenes. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe some of the stuff on maybe the, the, the tree. Maybe making the rock monster... What was the rock monster's name? The bringing yeah. him... Lo assembling... Lock, in Loki? Lock? Something like that? Lore. Yeah. Lore. 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 Whenever lore assembles and disassembles, yeah. I would believe there's also CG, but probably... The but the actual puppet, itself. when yeah. he was walking, that was an actual puppet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I do feel that it does definitely have Jim Henson's thumbprint on it, uh, for sure. And I think that uh, his legacy is, is not only capitalized, but expanded on in, in ways. I will be shocked if this series, Age of Resistance, does not get... Uh, some kind of a credentials for the visual aesthetic that they oh, created. At least I a mean, it will be a, it would be a huge snub from the film industry if they do not do this, and shame on them for not like looking in the right directions. Especially, you know, a lot of people want to snub Netflix and these uh, streaming platforms for the creativity, and they want to you know focus solely on film and cinematic. And you you can't do that. You you cannot do that because this. There's so much money, time, and effort spent in creating these sets and these puppets. Uh, I, did you guys get a chance to watch the one-hour documentary I after? I did. It was brilliant. Yeah. Beautiful. No, it was awesome. Dude, it was amazing. And the, just how they created the puppets and the animatronics and the eyes. The, even the irises are hand-painted mm -hmm. on the pupils of the eyes of the, of the Gelfling. Mm -hmm. Insane. So... Yeah, sorry. Now, I'll, go ahead, Austin. I'll let you have. No, it no, back no you're range. fine. I, I, everything you said is is literally what I echo to yeah. everyone. Is, is I just I think it honors it so well, and I, I have some points that I kind of want to hit on just because there are these integral things about this show that I yeah. believe make it one of the best shows we've seen all year on Netflix. Lindsay, Correct. I'll start yeah. with you. What are your okay. thoughts on just the set design elements of the show? Because this has some of the most vast and beautiful visuals. Looking at the backgrounds that i've seen maybe on tv over the last few years what are your thoughts on that um i can narrow it down to a single word and that word is majestic mm -hmm. i feel Ooh, that, I like that all of the scenes you go through so mm -hmm. many different environments you're going from desert to rainforest to underground and like cave-like areas where it's dark and dank yeah. and you can almost smell <laughs> yeah the soil. Like, yeah, the yeah. soil and whenever she's flying through, you see all these creatures. You can smell like the, the rainforest vibe almost. It's it, it's 
touching on all of those tender points of your emotion as you're going on this journey. Yeah. Yes. Even even the details with the puppets, and I know you were talking about landscape, but one specific, and it's towards the beginning, mm -hmm. um, one of the Sketskis has this mucus oh. draining pulse <laughs> the pulsing thing that's just snotting down and, and stringing yeah. yes. everywhere and i literally wanted to vomit mm -hmm. it like was invoking a physical reaction from me <laughs> so there is that attention to detail that is taking you to the next level yeah. of emotional in, in in drawing you in so it's not just this the environment but it's all the characters it's every Thing that the Henson Company touched in this series yes. took it to the next level. Wow. Isn't it incredible that in, in the world of CGI that we live in, we can get a series like this just kind of focused and based on practical effects that works this yeah. well with such a good story and, yeah. and that Somebody kind of leads, leads me into my next I mean, thing. Seriously. No, seriously. <laughs> and and just the, the dark elements of the villainous characters, but then you have kind of the, the spirit of hope that you can see yes. in our in our leads, that group that just, and you're so with them because you believe because it's visually spectacular. Like I felt like I was watching actual people because of, and my more. next point that I want to hit on, the puppeteering, mm. which is just, it takes what the 80s movie did. You have so many more people involved, along with focusing in on that, yet bringing in these incredible voice actors to lend their voices to the show. And this cast is completely stacked. But, Joe, I, I want to bring it back to you on the puppeteering, man. Yeah. Are you are you not impressed with what happened? Um, well, you know, any time that you recruit any puppeteer from the, the Jim Henson company, you're getting someone who's seasoned, who yeah. is polished, and can perform in ways. And, you know, there was, I was watching a, a piece, um, I can't remember if it was on the Labyrinth or what, but it was one of those ones where it kind of takes you behind the camera, and behind the scenes, and, and there was something that Jim Henson had said, is like, when you can convey motion, when you can convey emotion without speaking a word through the puppet, but just using the eyes, and and just the mm. the, hands the body and language the body of the language puppet. of the puppet yeah. if you mm. can get that connection with the audience you've achieved something that 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 you can't teach anyone else yeah and, and having that echo in the back of my mind having watching watching age of resistance there were so many moments especially with like deet you know <sighs> deet is kind of like the front runner the the lead if you will there's yeah. many leads but i think deet would probably she be is the main my one. favorite lead as yeah. you see right here this is deet in her underground world yes. and it's just there's so many moments where you could just feel the pain that the, you, you get up to like episode 7 and 8 when she goes back to her home area her homeland and she mm -hmm. finds that everybody's been dead or been taken prisoner yes. and you could just and see the just... emotion in her eyes and it's a puppet. Well, and it's not just her eyes, but they, they make her eyebrow, her, her brow scrunches up, her cheeks move. I mean, you know how many muscles are tears. in your face? They even have water <laughs> that comes down. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it was so real and genuine. And, yeah. they, and that's all the puppeteer. All the puppeteering. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's all yeah. the puppeteering. And that's and, all and one that. person. No, I was just going to, I mean, you mix that with. The, the visuals and the CGI as well. And like Joe said, there's not a lot of CGI in the show. It's just, no. that's that's not the way that they roll. But they do integrate it, especially when you look at the world and the background. And that's another thing that I was impressed with, not to go back to the 80s movie, but yeah. just the way that they made this entire, the scope, once you exit all of the buildings and you're out in this world, the way that they made that look, and they carry that over. And this is just a, a visual a visually splendorous thing to watch. It's colorful. I think the style is great. I think I think the cinematography is absolutely brilliant. Oh, yes. But one thing I want to talk about is the soundtrack and the score from the action scenes oh, to man. the emotional scenes, mm -hmm. getting you to gravitate towards the character. How are you guys feeling about this aspect of the show? Well, it's probably one of my favorite aspects. And I know Mike, he, uh, he probably wants to chime in here at some point, too, because Mike did finish all 10... Um, episodes as well yeah and uh, so I want to make sure that we get Mike in here as well definitely but the soundtrack not only echoed the original score it did but it, it was it was done in a way and if you watch the one hour documentary this is in there 
He's like, sometimes when you create elements of music, the less notes you use, only four chords, four mm. notes in some that. of those. And I remember that. It's, it's in the one-hour documentary on Netflix. After you watch this, you can watch it. But it was just really interesting because he created those four notes and used them in ways that normally your typical song, your typical artist wouldn't. And he used instruments and used methods that sound more majestic. And that's that word again, Lindsay. Majestic yeah. and the tonal mm -hmm. properties. And it just, there was moments I was just like, wow. I've never yeah. heard that instrument or I've never heard that. It reminded me a little yeah. bit of like Blue Man Group mm -hmm. because Blue Man Group creates yes. their own instruments. Yes. And I'm hearing some of these sounds that sounds like wind going through a pipe or mm. like some kind of giant stringed instrument being bowed by like yeah. a cello. And it's just, I'm just sitting here listening to this. And I, you know, one of the first things I pick up on in any film or series is the score. Because the score yeah. is the underlying tone and the underlying emotion that sets the pace for what you're seeing cinematically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they go, they're married together. They go hand in hand. Austin, you know all about this. I see you smiling oh, over there. Yeah. Definitely. I, but, My uh, favorite aspect of a show or a movie that you could possibly do is the soundtrack and the score. And oh, yeah. I do think this 1,000% <laughs> nailed it. Lindsay, go ahead. What are your thoughts on the soundtrack? Uh, I, I feel that we're dealing with a lore of aliens essentially yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you can't like... <clears throat> you can't compare this soundtrack to anything that you would find as a similarity on earth no. No, no it has its own uniqueness like joe said we're gonna keep echoing the word majestic it does have that even some regal moments whenever you're dealing with the the different madras yeah. the queen the queens of the world and sure. you can feel the emotion in there just like you would in any other movie you're tying in the emotion but you have this unique set of sounds that truly make it purely dark crystal yeah mm -hmm. you can't hear even the sound of the dark crystal is unique the oh, sound yeah. that him makes. You can't hear that and be like, you know what? That sounds kind of like an action movie, Superman or whatever, you know, because a lot of those action movies have a similar themed style. Mm, right. Or superhero movies kind of have that also, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, even love songs, you know, you have a certain style. This has yeah. its own unique signature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when the first time you hear Tony Stark's uh, hand photon. You yeah. Know, yes. yes. It's yes. almost like the first time you hear the crystal. The energy from the... You recognize it. Oh, that's... And then you just associate. Yeah. 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 It's, it's automatically programmed in your head. So... Yeah. But that's... I, I, I'm completely... Listen, the way that... And, and I love the comparison that you just made, but the way that I kind of associate these noises now, because I actually... I Listen, I am constantly listening to this score. So instead of music like a normal person, I will listen to soundtracks and scores of There movies. you go. Yeah. Me too. This one has been played over and over yeah. and over. It's on I Spotify for... Series. Yeah, yeah. And if something sticks with you to that degree, then, then I think it means a lot. And the, the final thing that we have to talk about is probably my biggest, I don't want to say issue, because it's not like, oh, I hate the movie because of it, but it's my biggest problem with the original movie. It is the story. It's kind of the writing. It's Listen, I love the lore. I love the entire concept, but I just don't think they focused in enough. And I honestly wasn't the biggest fan of our lead in the original movie. I think his voice, his story, his journey... That's yeah, what I'll say. His yeah. journey was good. Journey. But I think his um I think his voice work was a bit off. Now this show for me completely executes on all of yeah. that. It expands on the story, it expands on the lore, it has so much more action, and it's kind of not fair because it's 10 hours so you get to kind of do way more than the movie yeah. did. Well, but, the le the leads are more lovable. Right. And they are. And yeah. you have the voice talent. I mean, these are A-list, B-list actors coming in and lend their, lending their voice talent. You can tell. Uh, I, I want to get your all's thoughts on the story and the writing. Joe, we'll start with you. Was this better than the movie? Well, yeah. I, th I think in many aspects, I think, you know, Jim Henson, <clears throat> excuse me, is a visionary, right? You know, he, he, he created something that nobody could ever foresee being created. And, and that yeah. was puppetry to a scale that had never been done before. He's, he's this world's George Lucas, basically. Basically, yeah. yeah. That's a really great way to, to, to the similarities there. But I think, you know, somewhere in his visual aesthetic, Lost in, in the 82 film, was a little bit more of the dynamic storytelling. So yeah. if he yeah. could have got maybe George Lucas's storytelling from the 80s, not the 90s, oh my God. Yeah. But if he could have yeah. got Lucas's 80s storytelling married with, with Henson's puppetry of the 80s, 
Could have been yeah. a yeah. pretty crazy film. Uh, yeah. Or even, you know, something to the effect of, I don't know, I, I don't want to snowball too much on that, but with Age of Resistance, I think that the detail was, I think the story was the focal point first. Because there had to be so many twists and turns in the adventure to get to where they needed to go. That had to be, that had to be executed flawlessly. Yeah. Everything else, the visuals, the puppets, the soundtrack, the design, that all came, to, came later. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the story, for me, is the meat and potatoes of this. And that's, what, that's the driver for this. And yeah. I think they executed it flawlessly. Yes, it, 10 episodes, you're going to get a snoozer episode here or there. Or at least 40 minutes of a snoozer. And, yeah. and then at the end of the episode, you'll get something crazy. Yeah. But overall, the big picture, yeah. we get the world of the Gelfling. We get the world of Thra. We get it all mm -hmm. in Age of, Israel, uh, Age of Resistance. And I'm so, absolutely. I want to hear from Mike Ippolito. Yes. Because he's, he's been down here. He's been hanging yeah. out at the bottom. And I'm, it's time for him to come out of the hiding. All right, Dark Shadow, tell us what you're all about. I've just been sitting here patiently waiting. <laughs> so <laughs> what did you think about Age of Resistance? You know, the design, uh, the puppeteering, the soundtrack? First of all, I just, you know, you have to give credit where credit's due. The Jim Henson Creature Shop is just does phenomenal work for mm -hmm. what yeah. they've done, where they've taken a 30-year-plus character that they they had and pulled it out of the archives and created for a modern time and to make it look flawless transition yeah. <laughs> between the show and the movie. If they can take the movie and bring it up to the standard of video that we have now and include a season two as the missing elements that lead into the movie, this would be a completely flawless series. Yeah. Oh and my it, gosh, that would be amazing. And yeah, uh, yeah. and just to fill in that time frame that I'm hoping for a season two that or even a season three that would fill fill in that gap that leads up to the movie and this would this would be a, a completely flawless series. Or but, even a new cinematic film. Oh. Yeah. Well, how ma how many <laughs> thrine are between the the series and the movie? Is it a thousand? A thousand thrine, according it's a thousand to thrine. yeah. Yeah. So you got some time to work with some other storylines too in between there. Yeah. So yeah. yes, yeah, I'll get it worked then. But uh, it took me a while to get into the show. Um, it was actually until really was until episode four that I kind of really started getting into it. It seemed like very mm -hmm. very slow, you know. Uh, and then it started to pick up for me. I guess the first few episodes was kind of like the introduction of the characters, yeah. and that was kind of at a slow yeah. pace. And then it just started to pick up. Um, you know the. Um, it just it start I really started getting into it going into four and uh, then once they um, I'm just I can't remember a, a few of the characters but the one where they were climbing that mountain they got to the top and there was a Skeksy and a, and a Mystic in there. Oh, oh that yeah. was That's, great! I mean that was just hysterical. Awesome, yeah. Out in the Skeksy middle of the was, desert. Yeah, yeah and, he was just, and that was just kind of like the gave that the, the humor factor to it. You know that but, was Bill Hader in. Um, uh, yeah, it was Bill. It was Bill Hader and um, shoot. was he the Skeski? Yes, and and then no, uh, yeah, and uh, right? wait a minute, Bill Hader was the Mystic and Ryan uh, Sandberg was the Skeksis. Okay, okay. Yes. perfect yeah. pairing for that craziness. Yeah. Oh my! It took God. me a minute to remember, but yeah, yeah. And then that to bring was... in somebody like Mark Hamill. I mean, you can hear you can oh. hear the Joker in, in the voice, oh, you know. Yeah, but for sure. But the amount the 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 amount of actors that they had and, and like, like Austin said, the A and B list celebrities that came out. So, you know, somebody, you know, they, they felt, you know, um, to be part of this, to be part of this show, you know, that they, to, to lend their voices. So they, they believed in this, in this series as well. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, overall, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it as it got closer, you know, after season four. Did you, uh, was there, did, was you overall pleased with the finality, like the last couple episodes? Was you pleased with the battle scenes of the Gelfling and the Skeksis and all that? Yeah, I, I was, and, and now it kind of let me, uh, it kind of left me looking for more. I want to <laughs> see what's going to happen next. So Same. I do hope, you know, they can, you know, come up with, uh, you know, they go into a season two or maybe possibly season three that would lead up. I mean, as the movie kind of is the finale, they can, yeah. they can, they have a lot of story that they can, put in right. between and i really hope you know they have a a good team with netflix you know and and somebody really truly believed in this and at netflix and the jim henson company and yeah 
you know, the phenomenal work that they've done, you know, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And I think, in, Mike, yeah. you hit, you hit uh, the nail on the head there. I think if it wasn't for a platform and a streaming platform like, Net, like Netflix, yeah. I think if, it, if, if, if this was any other thing other than Netflix, we wouldn't have been able to have this happen. I'm with right. you. Yeah, definitely and, not. I know, think this is where it needs to be, where yeah. there's, you know, this is not for TV, not where you have to sit and watch commercials and stuff. Oh, you sit God. And you watch. And I think what their ultimate goal is, which I'm hoping is, is true, that they bring, you know, these retro classics back to a new generation. Mm. And I hope by releasing the prequel and, and any uh, sequential seasons after that brings in, that brings new life to this movie and a whole new yeah. audience to this. Wow. Definitely. Well, I think, you know, with all of this, Lindsay, do you want to bring it home for us? I will bring it home quickly. Um, just to touch on the story writing, I feel I, I'm going to keep echoing a lot of what has already been said, so I'm not going to dive too deep. But um, the prequel was definitely written like someone looked back at the old movie and was like, OK, what fell short? Oh, mm. that's yeah. good, and man. then they improved. I like that by looking With back and learning. They took what was great and made it spectacular, but mm, then what yeah. fell short, they brought it back up to the level it should be. And I feel Bingo. that's the reason why we are appreciating and liking the series a little bit more, even though we both we we respect all of it. Yeah, of I course. think I feel like we're liking the prequel a little bit more, and I think it's just from looking at the past and learning from the mistakes that didn't quite meet the standards yeah. of the Jim Henson Company, and they leveled it up. Perfect. Um, I feel like the movie overall had a great story, point A to point B storytelling mm -hmm. but i feel like it fell flat and it was missing the dynamics right. and that's what we are feeling in the series that really made it pop i mm. agree so I agree. um yeah. i think that's gonna wrap up the storytelling yeah. section yes. of this evening so um bring it home for uh for the <laughs> let's let's rate it Lindsay. i'm gonna give okay. it over to you um let's uh are you wanting to start with austin since well, we did the round table, or you want to do it with me? Okay, well, well I'll start. I'll do well, it. in the notes, it says Lindsay's <laughs> going to bring it home for us. So That's right. We are going to bring it home. Sorry. <laughs> um, we're not going to rate each, other, each episode on its own. We're just going to kind of do an overall score for the entire series because we'd be here all night talking it, breaking down each individual episode. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to put the series at an 8.1 for myself. Um, nice before we move on to the other scores, though, I would future episodes if we were to do a season two or whatever there is still the big question for me that needs to be answered is what happened that made the gelfling go extinct because oh, that's yes. the big thing that when you start the movie is mm. that they were so surprised to see a gelfling because they thought they had wiped them out completely yeah. Well, so, it was answered. It was answered in the last episode. You know the uh, the scorpion looking creature that uh, yeah. yes. the, the scientist created. That, His sole right. purpose was to hunt out and bring in and kill Galvin. Bring in all of them. So he was but, a hybrid. He was a hybrid between uh, the Skeksis DNA, uh, the Podling DNA, and uh, everything. And so he yeah. this you, you almost think of him like a Terminator yeah. in the world of Thra. And not only did they create just one, they created they create multiple an army of these of beings. Them. And those beings were the ones that single-handedly killed the Gelfling. Let's see. So I would love to see that story be told. Yeah, I would too. To kind of bridge the gap into the yeah. next movie. So anyways, I'll, I, awesome I, Burke. I give the golden microphone to the next. So we got an 8.1 <laughs> yeah, no. 8 from Lindsay, right? 8.1, Okay. Yes. I, I'm with you, Lindsay. I think that would be an awesome... Uh, direction to go with this series. Listen, I was um, I was hesitant. I was excited. This kind of filled in all of the things that I was missing from the movie. And honestly, guys, I had the time of my life watching this. I, I learned to appreciate the Jim Henson Company so much more because of this show. I'm going 9.2. I'm going really Whoa, high. Nice. I love this show. I yeah. loved every bit of it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, Micah, you want to chime in on yours? What you got here? You want to give us your official rating? Yeah, since it kind of started out a little slow for me before it got into around episode four, I'm going to go with uh, about an 8.7. 8.7. Uh, it just took me some time to kind of get into it. You know. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna... The visuals were just completely amazing. 
I'm glad you stuck with it, Mike, because I know you've been like watching a lot of stuff here lately. And I was like surprised when you texted me the other day and he's like, well, I just finished Dark Crystal. I was like, whoa. <laughs> nice. So that was pretty awesome to see that you, you stuck it out and you made it through the 10 episodes. Yeah. So uh, so we got 8.1, 9.4, uh, 8.7. Was it Mike? Was that Mike? 8.7? I think 8.7. 8.7. Yeah. 8.7. I'm going to have to go, I'm going to have to go 9.1. Yeah. I have to go a 9.1 because I can awesome. easily look past the slow points mm-hmm. and appreciate the overall vision that was I think the snot killed me. I oh. just really can't. <laughs> I think the snot was the snot was had to be there though. Cuz it had I to know. show how gross and disgusting Like the I said, it, they had to take it up a notch and they yeah. totally did. I, I well, agree. In terms of <laughs> just real quick, the, the slow points I I actually kind of agree with you guys. I do think it did start off, start off slow. My my reasoning for looking past that though is then I think of the movie and I'm like yeah. Well, even the slow parts of the show, it's like dang on going 90 miles per hour compared to the movie. So uh, maybe that's my mindset, but I do yeah. agree with you. It did get off I, to the I felt start. at least the first two episodes were slower than the movie started. Yeah. Ooh, off, so. no. See, the movie, yeah. I'm like, yeah, trudging through mud. So I want to hear what you guys uh, rated this. Uh, so if, you, if you're watching this tonight and, and you've seen Age of Resistance and you've seen the 82 film, uh, comment below in the comment section. That, look, we got one rating in already from one of our fans watching live. It's Sean Hockney. And uh, Mr. Sean gave it a 10. He's like, uh, he's a huge fan of the show, and he, he's always been, I guess, loyal to the Henson uh, family. And so Sean nice. gives it a, a if, you're, if you're here live streaming, be sure to, uh, yep. watching the live stream, rather, be sure to leave a comment, wow. and we'll Post give you a shout-out for the show. Yeah, All right, awesome. so, wow, guys, that was a really <laughs> awesome show. It is so good to be back for episode 102 Man, this has been a great one because I, I love talking about Henson Company and and especially, I mean, we get a platform where we can talk about Doc Crystal. That's pretty freaking awesome in my book. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Austin, uh, take it away. Oh, man, it's so it's so good to be back. I, I, I love doing this show with you guys, and this was a great way to start it off with Dark Crystal. My mm. goodness. So I'm Austin Burke at the Birkinator on the Twits. <laughs> and the Instagram, and you can find me on YouTube as well. We love twits. the twits. They're my favorite. Um, we are also part of an amazing network called the Gonna Geek Network. For all things even more geeky, head over to gonnageek.com and check out some amazing podcasts on our home network. Also, connect with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, Twitter, and Pinterest, uh, all at PopXCast. Send comments and suggestions for sure to us via email at popxcast at gmail.com. Also, for future and past shows, Visit our official website, www.popxcast.com. Yes, sir. And my friends, I am Lindsay Badger. You can find me at LR Badger all over the social places in the interwebs. <laughs> and we also need to give a huge shout out to our friends over at Wirecast and Mr. Stephen Haywood mm-hmm. and the Telestream company that makes Wirecast. Mm-hmm. He makes all the awesomeness that you're seeing around us possible. So thank you again for all of the goodness. It's so shiny. That you're helping us out with. There. Hey, Wirecast 13 dropped this week. That's right. They did. It dropped. It's got a, on tons it. of new features. So. Uh, huge uh, shout out to uh, that Tell was a Street. huge update. There's going to be lots of new. It was a big that I update. Can't wait to play with I even had I haven't even had a chance to unpack everything in there, so <laughs> I'm, I'm excited <laughs> this week to dive down it. All right, guys, I am Joseph Burke, aka at Joseph Burke Arts, all over the internet, and of course, I want to say uh, a huge heartfelt thank you to Team Pop X. I uh, really couldn't do these episodes without you. So Lindsay, Austin, and Mike up in Atlanta. Uh, you guys are li- oh, you're you're very <laughs> welcome. You're welcome. The doctor's in. Yes, he is. <laughs> there he is. Um, but uh, so join us next time uh, right here on episode 103 for Pop X Cast. We're going to try and see if Austin and I can get our schedules lined up while strike while the iron, iron's hot and see if we can do a Joker episode midweek this week. We'll see yeah. and we'll let you know how that turns out. If not, we will see you in about a week or so for episode 103. So don't go nowhere. Thank you for listening. Thanks for downloading. And you know what? Get your geek on. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. From everyone at PopX Cast, thanks for listening. 
please make sure to like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash popxcast, and click the follow button to get our live stream notifications. Drop us an email, popxcast at gmail.com. Be sure to check out this and more great content on the Ghana Geek Network at ghanageek.com. Get your geek on! Get your geek on!